My name is Jim, uh, and today's uh, topic is about wiring. And uh, we're going to start out basically at the pole, see how electricity gets into your house, and then talk about some details thereafter. So, somewhere on a pole in your neighborhood, or it could be buried underground, depending upon if you're in a newer uh, development or not, is we have some questionable voltage coming into the pole in kilovolts. And this is derived from the three phase power transmission that's feeding neighborhoods and it goes into a transformer which is 270 volts center tapped. So that center tap means that we have 120 on both sides of it and they're 180 degrees out of phase. So what this is going to allow us to do inside of our house is to, um, to support appliances you need 240 volts. So the center tap is basically a steel guy wire if you will. It's bare and it, uh, it goes from the pole uh, to our house and is strain relief to our weather head that, that leads into our house. And the two other wires in, in modern times are wrapped around the supporting line. That's called triplex. And uh, in older installations they actually had three wires running in. So with the advance of uh, new insulation they can actually do it this way which is kind of uh, kind of nice I think. So at the pole also you have a wire going down the pole that picks up an earth ground. And once we get into the weather head on our electric feed, it goes down a conduit, a metal pipe, or could be plastic, into the meter box. Now the meter box has four slots in it <coughs> and the actual meter itself has four uh, I'll call them uh, contacts and uh, they plug in here there's no ground connection to the meter and this side connects to the incoming power and this side goes down into your breaker box so the meter is usually sealed on here with a tag so only the electric company or a licensed technician should be able to cut that and then uh, they replace the tag and that's so people don't play around in here without the electric company knowing about it and it's a good thing that the meter is set up like that. Also your meter box has an earth ground and this is a rod about eight feet long which is pounded into the ground with usually a bare wire going to it and uh, the recent code out here uh, requires a second earth ground which is eight to ten feet away so there's now two of them uh, that you need to um, put in and if you're doing this they have devices for pounding pipe into the ground which are, are quite effective, quite easy to do. So uh, this is what it looks like in your house and um, out here in the community we had an electrician do work and he put in a used meter receptacle and uh, what's supposed to happen is that the receptacle has two pieces of metal like this and then the blade for the meter goes in and it's supposed to spread them apart. You have to push it in and he used to use box and one of these was sprung meaning to say that it was not squeezing the electrical uh, uh, contact and gave us an intermittent and we ended up calling another electrician in who did the job right so never call him again but um, I was involved in this and there's no way I'm messing with this stuff it's just too dangerous So once it, uh, the power gets into our house, and you have to excuse this drawing, uh, there's um, PDF files which have this in the uh, uh, course directory, but I, I need to make this point, is that uh, in the days of yesterday when I lived in Manor, the breaker panel had to be within five feet of the meter. And if it isn't, you have to install a main breaker right underneath the meter panel to feed your breaker box. So we have these two uh, voltages coming in. I call them phase one and phase two. And keep in mind that they are 180 degrees out of phase. And the bus that feeds the circuit breakers. Now, the bus is something which connects one or more devices together. Like you could have a transmitter and a receiver, one wire bus, or in this case many connections on this depending upon how many circuit breakers you put in. So we have three buses basically in the box. 
one for phase two, one for phase one, and then a third one for the neutral slash ground. Sometimes the grounds are independent. In the three places that I've lived in, they're the same, um, the same bus. So this is heavy metal with screws. That's what these are. And the reason that they have this funny interconnecting pattern in the breaker box is if we had a 220 volt appliance like say an electric water tank or a gas dryer we would plug in two breakers adjacent to one another one breaker would pick up one phase and the other breaker would pick up the other phase so the wires leaving here then would be black and red so if this is going to be feeding a 220 volt appliance this would be 12, 3 with ground. Black, red would be hot, and white would be neutral, and ground is a bare wire. Also, the handles on this, the bats, that you reset, turn the power on, turn the power off, are linked together. So if one of these has a fault, it turns off power in both. And if you want to shut the line off to do some maintenance on it is you turn both off at the same time. You don't have to flip two things. You want to turn them on, both go on at the same time. So that's a good thing and that's why they have this funny zigzag sort of bus um, available is so that it, you can use it to feed 220 volt appliances. And you can plug these in anywhere as long as they're physically adjacent. Now let's take a look at uh, the breaker box and we have a local feed here and the wire coming in is, is called Romex and uh, this is an example of it. This is 12-2 uh, with ground and I've left the cardboard on it for a time being but anyway uh, Romex enters the box and it comes in through the box on a device that looks like this so there'll be knockouts on the box, little holes you knock out, and you place these in it and then there's a nut that goes on the back that holds it in place and it has little tabs on it. I've got it here somewhere in front of me. But anyway, you take a screwdriver on that and you pound on that nut, it bites into the side of the box so this doesn't rotate. Then the Romex is slid through the hole. I'll leave the cardboard on, I have a reason for doing that and you leave about that much of the plastic sheath showing and then you tighten these screws and what that does is it squeezes the Romex so it won't pull out of the box, it won't wiggle around. Once that happens you serpentine the wires, you leave plenty of slack and then you pick up in this case the black lead is hot meaning 120 volts, that would go to a circuit breaker screw and then the uh, the white lead which is neutral and the ground lead which is bare would go to this. You never put two wires under a screw. If your box ever gets inspected, if you want to sell your house you'll get a hit on that. So it's one wire per screw and these are designed so you can really crank the screws without worrying about stripping them. So you often see boxes and they look terribly not neat and that's done for a purpose so you have flexibility uh, inside of this and it doesn't really cause any, uh, any problems whatsoever. So uh, this is the same kind of device that you would use in a, uh, in a uh, box like this in your basement. Oh, here's a nut. And again, you have these knockouts. You hit them with a hammer and then a screwdriver, wiggle them back and forth, and they'll fall out. And they give you a lot of choices on this, depending upon what your needs are, to install one of these strain relief devices. Now, uh, if we talk a little bit about a, uh, a plug, is uh, what we'll see is that if we actually look, a receptacle rather, if we actually look at it, we see the ground, and we have a thin blade and a thick blade, and that would correspond to this. This is the thin blade, and the thin blade is the 120 volt. That's the hot, hot lead. The long uh, blade here along the hole if you will is the neutral and then the ground is on top and the correct way to install this is to ground up the hole up. Now the reason for that is and this actually happened here is uh, my wife was removing a metal wall plate which was kind of decorative and her thought was just to paint behind it and then put it back and television was plugged in 
and uh, what had happened is she dropped the wall plate and it came down and was able to fit between the plug and the receptacle, hit the two uh, plugs and burnt nice little arcs in the, uh, in the wall plate. Didn't do any damage, but if that were upside down and the same thing were to happen, the metal plate would hit the ground. So that's the correct way to install them is with the ground hole on top. Now if we uh, take a look at this, it is a 15 amp outlet. And on the back, what we see here are there four holes, and those holes are called quick connects. And um, the purpose of those is that if we on the side there's a depth gauge, cut wire to the right length, we can simply insert them into the hole and we don't have to mess around with any of the screws. Now, being a 15 amp outlet, the only kind of wire you can put in here is 14 gauge wire, which for residential use is rated for 15 amperes. So, seeing that this house is wired for uh, 12 gauge everywhere with 20 amp breakers, and this is 12 gauge, I cannot do this. So, I've got a choice. I can either wire nut a 14 gauge piece of wire to a 12 gauge piece coming from the wall, or I can make a hook out of this, and I have to be careful what side. Black goes to gold, white goes to silver. Make a hook out of this, put it on the screw. There we go, and uh, take some long nose pliers, squeeze these together, and then tighten it down. And the reason that uh, you want to have it hooked in this direction is that when you tighten these screws clockwise it'll tend to pull the wire pull the hook toward the center if I had it this way it would tend to spread the wire out so it makes a better contact um, if you if you put it in such that you're tightening clockwise it's in the direction that I have shown here then you don't want to leave the other guy sticking out so you just screw him in on the other side this is where your white wire would go same deal um, clockwise screwing down and then your ground is this green screw here and these are always green and your bare wire would go there and in certain circumstances also pick up a uh, ground on a, on a metal box like this guy too so anything anybody can touch is, is going to be a ground potential now the reason that you want to ground a metal box is that if a hot lead comes in contact with the box for any reason it'll blow a circuit breaker. So you never want to have a, a hot box. So this being a 15 amp outlet, which most are in your house, even though it's on 12 gauge wire with a 20 amp circuit breaker, really should only have appliances plugged into it to draw 15 amperes or less. Now, if you need or have an appliance that has, uh, say, it's drawing between 15 and 20 amps, and an example of that, would be a floor sander. Um, it'll have a plug which looks like this, where one of the blades is perpendicular to the other, so you cannot plug it into a standard outlet. But you can, for additional money, buy a 20 amp receptacle, and that has one of the blades here, this guy looking with a T in it. So this can be used for conventional plug or as a high current plug. The reason this is more expensive is that the contacts inside of this and so forth are heavier to do that. So that's why you'll see some plugs maybe that have that um, or not. Okay, um, these are just notes for myself here. There's a lot to, to talk about. Yeah, quick connect because that's what I told you about pushing these in here. Um, and the other is a split circuit. Now, we have two screws each screw feeds an outlet, plus there's a piece of metal connecting the two together. Well, suppose we wanted this to have a lamp plugged in in our bedroom, and this would be a television set. And we wouldn't want the TV set being switched. So right in between these two, there's a little bridging piece of metal. And if we take uh, long nose pliers, we can wiggle that back and forth and break it. And that means that these here are going to be independent. So. The, uh, the light receptacle would be receiving its hot wire, its black wire here, 
and then the receptacle which is on all the time would be receiving a different black wire here which is always hot. So half can be switched and the other half can be uh, continuously on. So that's what those little taps are for. And it's really not a good idea if you're doing a loop through on an outlet box to try to have one side coming in attached to this screw and the side going out attached to this screw because what you end up with is kind of a bad situation. You're trying to push five to six wires back in the box and this is stiff wire. So there's a possibility of pushing the box through the wall. Done it. So the best way to do that as I've shown down here is you have an incoming black wire and this is going to be daisy chained over to another outlet box and um, when I lived in Menor the code said that I could have no more than five outlets per circuit breaker. So here what I'm showing is a wire nut, we'll talk about that in a minute, with a lead coming off which would go to the, the outlet itself. So I'm only dealing with three wires and what I want to do is kind of fan fold these wires so when I go to push this into the box it kind of folds in real nice because if the wire comes off straight out not going to work. You've, you've got to be able to bend it so it flexes to get this um, into the wall. When you screw this into the wall there will be a couple of receptacles for these screws and you don't tighten them down all the way. You actually have it so that the outlet can float back and forth. And then when you put the plate on that's when you straighten it up. Okay so we have about wire nuts here. Um, AWG 12, American Wire Gauge 12 gauge and what you see in the store that would be called 12-2 with ground and 14 gauge would be 14-2 with ground and if you were running a 220 volt line say for a dryer that would be 12-3 with ground because you're going to need two hots on that the two 120's which are out of phase a neutral wire um, and a ground wire so uh, let's talk about wire nuts here <coughs> Um, this is what they look like and inside of one, well you can't see it, there's a wire spring that looks like an ice cream cone metal. It comes up to here and what that spring does is when you put it on the wires is it bites into the wire and uh, therefore makes a connection. Now when you buy these the box will tell you the minimum and maximum gauge of the wire and in addition to that how many you can fit in. So for example a yellow wire nut at maximum can take three 12 gauge wires and to me that looks pretty tight so I don't use yellow I use red which can also take three um, 12 gauge wires. Now when you put a wire nut on many times as was shown uh, and I've cut these long for a, a good reason because what you want is that the bare wire stops at the shoulder of the wire nut. So you never want to have copper outside of the wire nut. Is they just say, well, you take the wires and you stick the wire nut on and you screw it till it's tight? Sure. Here I am holding these. Real easy to do. Now, get on the floor somewhere and try to do this with one wire wanting to go this way, another that way, and the third wire a different direction yet. It's not so easy. And if one of them ends up being longer than the other, what happens is that will hit the end of the wire nut and that spring inside, that metal spring, won't, may not bite into the other two wires effectively and you end up with a hot spot. So you make them all the same and then take a significant set of pliers, um, put them on the wires and twist them. do this here. This is where it's really pretty stiff so I wouldn't have the trouble if it were in a wall. And then when you get it twisted, and this would not include the actual insulation part, you're in pretty good shape to put a good wire nut on. Now if one wire is sticking out, and even if they're not, you take your cutters and shielding other people in the room, <laughs> these are kind of old cutters, so 
get it cut through here. I didn't intend for this to happen, but there we go. Cut too many steel bolts with that. Then you have your three twisted together and you put your wire nut on and what you're guaranteed is, is that the ends are all the same length. So you don't have that one wire pushing up on the top and then you tighten it and try to get wire nuts that have these little wing things on them, some of them are round without it, until it really tightens down. You don't have to worry much about stripping this. And you start to tighten this until you see the actual installation start to, to tighten. And then you've got you know a pretty solid connection with regard to this. Um, and the reason these work is because they exclude air. But that's where the spring actually bites into the metal. So the two things you have to be careful of is that you have to wear glasses, of course. I mean, there's no reset on eyeballs. Take your hand and make sure that the ejecta from cutting the wires doesn't fly across and hit somebody in the face. And third, you only, only do this on unenergized circuits. You never have anything energized when you're playing with this stuff. Your life is worth too much to take a risk. All you got to do is get it across here in the wrong circumstances, and, you know, you're, you're gone. So... Take your time, so it takes you a little bit longer. There's 10,080 minutes in a week, so you spend a couple extra doing it right. You know that's that's important here. So uh, let's see here. Uh, we got feed through um, you know, splice box. Um, we'll just speak about that for a minute. I held it up before. This is an example of a splice box that you put in your rafters, and it has two little devices here. It's pretty sharp and you put that up against the wall, get it all lined up right, and then hit this with a hammer and it'll drive and temporarily hold the box into the wall until you get screws to go through here to securely hold the box. So here we have the knockouts that I spoke to before and some of them are actually bigger. For example, there's a knockout inside of a knockout. So if I were doing some heavier gauge wire in here, I can actually buy uh, a larger one of those connectors that I had up here, one of these guys, would be physically larger to, to go into that. In addition to that, if you like, you've got a couple of different kinds of knockouts here. And you just stick a screwdriver in there and wiggle a little bit and that would break. And then underneath, the strain relief is this piece, so the wire would be coming through. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, and that do this right. I'll just stick this through without the paper on it. I'd have to put the knockout in it. Yeah. Anyway, the wire would be coming through. Again, you leave a little bit of the yellow showing or the, whatever the color of the wire is. Uh, and then you tighten this down, which would squeeze the wire and serve as a strain relief for it. So you don't want the wire wiggling around inside of the box once you get, uh, once you get that in position. Okay, yes, splice box. Now, uh, there we go. That'll work. Let me get my little tester here. You can buy these at Home Depot. Uh, this is one I designed and my partner made it. And what you do is you hold these up next to a wire that's energized. And this is a power feed for the camera. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it uh, turns red when you're next to the hot lead. And what you have to be careful of when you buy these in the stores is you don't want to trust these with your life. Um, I've been lied to by a commercial one, the end of an extension cord. This one's always worked and the reason it does work is because I use my body as a ground antenna. But still, not 100% certain that the power's off. So if you have a, a voltage tester like this, always check it on a lamp cord or something to make sure that it does work before you do it and always keep in the back of your mind there's a possibility that the device has failed, meaning that you could be actually cutting through a live wire. Been there, done that too. Um, need to wear safety glasses because there's ejecta. It melts grooves in the cutters. 
wrecks them basically. Big spark scares the heck out of you if you're standing on a ladder. Okay, so let's talk about ground faults a little bit. And uh, here we have a circuit, and this is coming from the breaker box. And this is the circuit breaker here, and I've shown the black lead, the hot lead, going into the screw on it. And that comes over to our appliance, if you will, and it's feeding the electronics inside of it. And we have our white wire, which feeds the electronics inside of it. And our green wire is actually feeding and connected to the metal case of the box. Now if we have a fault where the hot comes in contact with the metal box is we don't want anybody touching that box and getting lit up. So by taking the green wire, remember that the green and the neutral are connected together and connecting it to the metal box, any fault that can happen inside of this would cause a breaker to break. So we're not physically dealing with an electrically hot metal case. So that green wire can really really come in handy now, if we don't have a ground wire or we elect not to connect it um, and we have a fault, and here's our little guy, he's not the brightest dude in the world, he's standing in water here with a little fishy, and he touches that box, he's got a nice path of current right through his heart. Bad situation. So when you're dealing with grounds, even though they're bare wire and even though the circuit will work without them, always connect them properly. So, if we uh, want to protect against things like this, uh, we can install a ground fault circuit interrupter. Now, that's a relatively large device, and it looks like a regular outlet. It has three wires coming into it, and uh, if we were to plug something into the GFCI, and here's our guy again, and now he's touching the hot wire while he's standing in water, you know, or whatever. What the GFCI does is it compares the current flow leaving and coming back into itself. And if there's around an 8 milliampere or greater difference, it immediately opens the circuit. So in this case, he might feel a tingle, but the circuit would be open and he wouldn't be killed. So GFCIs are required anywhere that you'd be around any wet spots, say in a bathroom or in a garage and there's test and reset buttons on them also. Okay, when you're wiring, black goes to gold screws, white, neutral, goes to a silver screw, and green goes to a green screw. Uh, sold a house once and an electrical inspector came in and reported that two of the uh, outlets were reversed, these two. So I had to take them apart and fix them. I didn't do it. Um, but they checked every single out in that house. So you want to make sure you get it right. So um, here we have a GFCI again, and this time I want to protect a downstream outlet from it. For example, in your bathroom, maybe you have an outlet on this side of the sink and on that side of the sink, and instead of trying to install two GFCIs, I can loop through one. So 120 coming in here, and I'm not showing the grounds because they would be connected everywhere like they're supposed to be, is a 120 black and a white neutral, and this goes into the line side of the GFCI. Now, this is really important. The load side of the GFCI usually has a piece of tape over the screws so you don't get them confused, because if you get it in backward, it is not going to work. But if you're daisy chaining through it, then this outlet would be connected to the load side, and any ground faults over here will pop this breaker. Now, what's important to know for the person that's plugging in here is that this is connected and protected by this GFCI. So when you buy one of these, they give you a couple of tags, and you put the tag on the uh, outlet plate below it saying GFI protected, so at least somebody would know, oh, go over here and push the reset, and before I do that, find out why it tripped. Uh, not a good thing. I had a microwave once in, um, in Parma, I used to live there, and the GFCI protecting the microwave oven was in the garage wall right behind it, and when they quit working, it took me forever to figure out what. And the last thing in the world I want to do is take one of those off the wall, and I, I don't have to. So you can protect uh, multiple outlets with one GFCI, and the problem with a GFCI, if you do this, is that at best, you're pushing this into the wall with five wires attached to it. 
and it's really not an easy thing to do. So you make, they have to make sure that all your wires are folded in the right direction before you put heel your hand on it and try to push this thing in. Another house I had in was sold at GFCI in this little bitty box, metal box. And I ended up taping around the screws just to be sure, and it was hard to push that in. Didn't, didn't like that at all. So um, we have uh, ground fault circuit interrupters, and uh, a lot of building codes now require what's called an arc flash circuit interrupter. And uh, that would be used for any circuits feeding um, a bedroom. Because what people tend to do is, if they need a lamp on this side of the room and the outlets across the doorway, they'll run a wire underneath the carpet. And that wire is subject to wear and tear and friction, and if it's a standard zip cord for a light, it'll wear out and start to spark, and it can cause a fire. So what an arc flash interrupter does is it looks for quick changes in current, thinks that's an arc, opens the circuit, no deal. Also in new construction, you need a dedicated circuit for smoke alarms, you know, on its own circuit. So that smoke alarm is going to be active even if, say, there's a blown breaker for the living room, something like that. Okay, um, GFCI is a good thing. Uh, one other story about this, and oh, I'm going to show you this too. Um, this is a GFCI circuit breaker, and it says push to reset, and this is 15 amp here, on and off. And what it requires with this pigtail is this goes to ground uh, in the box. So this would go where the neutral and the ground leads go for every other circuit in your house. This has to be wired for this guy to work. These are kind of expensive. Um, when I bought this, it was $30. And it's kind of nice because it can protect, say, a whole room. And the downside of it is if it turns itself off because of a ground fault is you kind of don't know exactly where it is. And the situation that happened is my neighbor had his house spray painted and he had three outlets on the outside. Not spray painted, spray washed. And he got water into these and you know he says I can't, I don't have any power. So I ended up going over and changing all three uh, receptacles and then getting back in service again. But so there's an upside and a downside to having a well, circuit breaker that's ground fault protected everything on is okay and then if you have to identify where an actual fault is well, a little bit more complicated. Now fuses, uh, I need to mention this when this house was built in 1975 uh, a maker of circuit breakers don't remember the name of them made a bad product and houses were burning down so I requested the builder put in a fuse box instead of circuit breaker box and he went out and was able to find one and repainted it but a fuse basically is like uh, was like in a light bulb socket and now they in current times they had them so that they have a different pitch for different ampere ratings so you can't put a 30 amp uh, fuse in a 20 amp circuit but basically it's a piece of metal and there's it gets kind of thin in the middle and I squared R causes that to melt um, if you're operating slightly above the rated current of the fuse itself. So um, fuses also fatigue and this has happened many times here when I had the fuse box is every time you turn on a high current device like a dryer is this piece of metal gets a little warm and expands and contracts and eventually that breaks and doesn't blow it's broken and the bad thing about it is is that you don't get the big dark spot on the, uh, the little piece of glass on it just have to take them out and home check them and things like that. Now if you come across the fuse like in a microwave oven, I, this happened once um, when was I living in matter, is the microwave, uh, microwave oven blew an internal fuse in a control panel. So I took it apart and it was a typical fuse that you would plug into say an older automotive product or whatever except this wasn't glass, it was brown ceramic material. Now what that's about is that if you blow a fuse and it's an inductive load, is you can actually have an arc flash inside the fuse. 
that is, it's hot enough so that air inside gets ionized and still conducts electricity as it slowly melts these things back and forth. Now these brown fuses are filled with sand. And so are the big ones, you know, the, the mains. So if you blow a fuse, what will happen is, is, is the sand will fall down between both ends of the contacts and quench any flash. So if you see brown, replace it with brown. Don't, don't replace it with glass. Some little paper in here. Okay, three-way wiring. Um, let's talk about that for a minute. And three-way means that there are two switches controlling one fixture, and we'll call the fixture a light bulb. And this might be on one side of the room, and this might be on the other side of the room. And then in uh, one of the switch boxes, you'd have your standard input here of um, hot white, which is neutral, and green, and you'd have to buy a three-way switch. Now, a three-way switch has four screws on it. One of them is green for brown, uh, for ground, the other is black, and uh, the other two screws are silver, gold, whatever. It's the black screw of interest. Connecting these two switch boxes together, and we'll say that this is on the left side of the living room and this is on the right side of the living room, you need 12-3 with ground. So we're actually talking about two hot leads, a neutral, and a ground. And then when we get to the other switch, and we're going to wire that into the fixture, that would be standard Romex going up to, say, a ceiling light. Now what the circuit looks like, and uh, this does not include any grounds, is what we, the electrical folks, would call single pole double throw switches. And if you look at the two of these, is what you can see, is that either switch can turn on or off the circuit no matter what position the other switch is. So ordinarily when you have a switched circuit when you push the bat up it's on and down it's off. With a three-way there's no on and off. It's determined by the position of the other switch. You ran out of time on that I guess it turns itself off. And what I found is I put this inside of this furnace and the whole thing lit up everywhere. I mean, everything was hot. The returns were hot. Everything was lighting up the lights, saying 120 volt field was in the vicinity. And what had happened is, is that somebody installed a wire nut incorrectly, and it actually caught fire. Uh, it, it got hot and burnt the plastic off the wire net and burnt some of the plastic. And fortunately, this was inside of a breaker box, and. Um, it didn't didn't cause any damage, and you can see the charred marks and so forth. So, have to be a little bit careful when you're you're working with uh, wire nuts. Always uh, try to put them on correctly. Okay, uh, that'll do it, and uh, thank you for watching.